Oh. So as I, none of us know actually what oh an boy, astronaut oh augury boy. is. There we go. And so yeah. we come as an astronaut family to answer all of your questions. <laughs> on the, has it not been the greatest day? Good day. I mean, even when you know it's coming, you know you're going to come here, you know you're going to hear things that you've not even imagined could make you think, well, maybe, right? It's just, it's, it's simply amazing. And then I don't know how many of you got to see that at 3.14 this afternoon, three more humans left the Earth. For the, oh. I was going to say for the first time, but actually two of them, yeah, tried before. two of them had an aborted launch just a few months ago, which is not a usual thing for us. So it was probably a pretty amazing day for Nick Hagen, Alexi, and Christina, her first launch, and they are in space waiting to dock. Excuse me, waiting to dock with the International Space Station uh, today. Uh, I will let. Uh, let's see. I guess we'll just take a seat. And yeah. we're gonna, in the middle. I want to be in the middle? Okay, kind of, we, we had good chemistry being in the middle. We already <laughs> actually practiced We've on We've been uh, on this couch before. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, so we thought we would just start with a few slides to introduce ourselves and some of the things that we've done. Um, I didn't get to put your last things in there. Okay. So we're just like a little bit of a mis mishmash. We, I mean, we embrace the F word. Flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> Blessed are the flexible, for they are never disappointed. It's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, so I wanted to show the, the space shuttle, um, because the three of us have all flown on the space shuttle. And, uh, and, and it's a really amazing, special experience to leave the planet in a vehicle built by so many people. And the fact that it could bring so many people to space has meant a lot to the program to bring so many more different kinds of people uh, to space. I myself flew on two space shuttle, two, one space shuttle, Space Shuttle Columbia, twice um, on a laboratory mission, getting ready for the International Space Station. Uh, doing 30 different science experiments. And then a second mission for me as, as a chemist, a really unusual mission, um, to be in charge of launching the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And so to see that several times in the slides this morning that Sam Ting showed, really mean, it means a lot to me. It was a telescope that when we launched it, um, first of all, there's people that had waited their entire careers, 25 years from the time they thought of it right. to the time it launched, knowing that if they put it up there, we would see things and discover things and understand the universe in a different way which in the case of Chandra, um, which specializes in high energy events like supernovas, galaxies colliding, and black holes, as were just explained. Um, Chandra has really shown a light on the universe. And it was only supposed to work for five years. That was back in 1999. It is still working today. And our mission was also famous because we had the first woman commander, um, and that is Colonel Eileen Collins. Uh, and it was really just a pleasure to, to serve with the first woman commander of the space shuttle and, and experience a different kind of management style than I was used to. And at the same time, uh, <laughs> well, that's true. And, you know, it's a little bit, it can be a little bit military there, even though uh, only 40% of the astronauts are military. And uh, let's see. And this, these are the three folks that launched today. This is Nick Haig and Christina in the middle and Alexei uh, Ovchenin. And maybe you can say that better for me, Nikolai. Uh, so, uh, Alexey Evchinin, he's a Russian uh, cosmonaut, he, uh, actually commander of the Soyuz vehicle, uh, which already been launched. And Christina Cook, uh, she used to be my crewmate. Uh, when, yeah, <laughs> we were in the backup crew just a few months ago, uh, actually a little bit more than one year. And Nick Heck, uh, he's an American astronaut, He's a great professional, and so they are on the way to International Space Station right now after launch. They doing uh, a lot of checks of Soyuz spacecraft, of uh, docking and rendezvous systems, and pretty soon they will dock to ISS, and their expedition will start. <laughs> so, Nikolai, um, I. I'm not a professional panel person. I'm usually like on the panel as opposed to moderating. <laughs> so maybe um, we'll all just introduce ourselves. So Nikolai, why don't you just uh, say, uh, we won't do slides, just to, just say a little bit about your background and... Um, I've been preparing to space flight since 20, uh, late, late 2012. Um, I graduated from South Russian Technical University as computer science and control system engineer. And I was selected to cosmonaut core October 2012, and so I'm on my way to International Space Station and beyond, I hope. <laughs> Thank you.
Nicole is next. We've also got one more crew member coming. We had quite an agenda today, and, but it sounds like he'll be able to make it in a few minutes, Tony Antonelli. But Nicole, why don't you go ahead? Uh, Nicole Stott. I, uh, seems like I worked for NASA forever. I was with NASA for about 28 years and started out at the Kennedy Space Center with the Space Shuttle and the Space Station program. I think we met there when you were getting ready to fly That's right. your first time. And, uh, and then spent a couple years at the Johnson Space Center as a flight engineer on the shuttle training aircraft, which was such a cool airplane, um, where we trained the astronauts to land the space shuttle. Uh, selected by some act of God, I would say, in the year 2000 as an astronaut uh, way back when, and uh, have been blessed to fly two times in space, um, to and from the space station, both times on the space shuttle, first time up on Discovery, a uh, little over three months on the station, and then home on Atlantis with, uh, with Leland, and then about a year later on the final flight of Discovery, um, back to the station, but only for two weeks, which was absolutely not long enough. And I believe you had to pull my clawing hands off the hatch to get me <laughs> shoved back in, in the <laughs> shuttle. <laughs> That's true. She did not want to yeah. go. Leland? Hi, Leland Melvin. I, uh, I was one of these people that played some football with the Lions and the Cowboys before joining NASA. As one does. As mm. many people I do. I thought right? about it. Yeah. <laughs> I was busy. They called. <laughs> But, um, but when I went to NASA, you know, I was working as a research, assist a research scientist and at NASA Langley. And a friend of mine gave me an application and said, hey, you'd be a great astronaut. I'm like, yeah, right. And I threw it down. And, and this other friend of ours, Charlie Camarda, he got into the astronaut program. And I said to myself, wait a minute. NASA's letting knuckleheads like that in to be astronauts? <laughs> and so I applied the next election and I got in. And um, I had a, a serious medical issue I lost all my hearing in a training accident in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. And they told me that I would never fly in space, but I just stayed diligent and persisted and flew two times, uh, 2008 and 2009, on both on Atlantis. And we installed the Columbus Laboratory to the space station. And I thought that, would, well, we're gonna get on some more stuff. So anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm uh, Katie Coleman, uh, uh, an affiliate Here's of the Tony. Media Lab here. And Tony Antonelli coming up. Woo woo, Just Tony! In time. Mm -hmm. you awesome. <laughs> See right here. Okay. So we did, we're actually just telling a little bit about ourselves and we're doing a few slides. What's your story? Who are What's you? What's your story? What, who are What's you and, and why are you sitting on this couch? Do you have a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> ah. It's not wired. Let's see. Uh, I'm not Russian, not an artist, <laughs> not super talented, wasn't drafted in the NFL. <laughs> yeah. But I have big dreams. I hope to become uh, something grand uh, in my life. Um, I was uh, MIT, uh, Core 16, a while ago. Were y'all saying years, or are we leaving that out? You can leave it, leave it out. It was a while ago. Um, and uh, um, Happy to be here. I'm more excited than y'all to hear uh, their stories because uh, I know they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, we actually, you know, we actually never get to hear each other's stories, except for a little bit at three o'clock yeah. today when we're talking to the kids. Yeah. Um, so we were just talking about how uh, these great folks launched today, and and uh, just to show you a little bit more about what they're getting into and what that was like. Um, we don't have the actual launch footage for them, but I have a little of of mine. And uh, anybody who wants to jump in and say things, it's, it's a free for all in this uh, case. But I it's like to show people. It's the size of a football field? Wow. <laughs> There's not a football field in I, space, though. <laughs> I know about the football field, and I know the ball is shaped a little strange. All right. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> the only place I can throw a ball well is up in space, and Leland knows that. But I do like to show this for size. We don't live on the part that's like, you know, um, goalpost to goalpost, but we live on the 50-yard line there in those modules, which is like giant school buses without the seats in them, about 10 of them all strung together, but some are up and some are down. And so we, when we travel up, it's in the Soyuz, and you'll see that in a minute. It's really small. It's, it's, we're sitting closer than we're sitting right here. And, uh, and yet once we get up into space, it's really lots and lots of, of space. This is the Soyuz itself. Uh, do you want to describe it, Nicola? Yeah. I, Oops. I, I, that, yeah. I use lots of... So this, this is the Soyuz uh, spacecraft. Uh, it has three uh, modules. Actually, uh, cosmonauts and, uh, and astronauts are in the center of the Soyuz spacecraft. We call it, cap we call it just capsule or descending module. And there is a service module with all stuff like computers, uh, thrusters, and 
batteries, etc. And on the top of the source, you can see uh, uh, our living room, actually. <laughs> it's, and it's really like a living room. Like We don't really use it except for when we're going to be in space for a little bit, like the planned kind of rest before docking. Uh, or actually, we, we use it like right? a cargo room. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And on the top, uh, there are a lot of antennas, uh, which is very useful to measure uh, parameters of docking and uh, rendezvous. So <laughs> that's it. So about 6 p.m. tonight, the, um, the docking probe will they'll, they'll approach the space station and actually dock, do a lot of pressure checks, open the hatch, and their almost six months in space will begin. How, how big is it? You said it's like a living room. So I got like a couch, a love seat, <laughs> a lazy boy. You got a divan. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's like three smart cars it's, put together. I mean, it's, it's really pretty it, tiny. It's a little bit bigger than a uh, uh, descent module because descent model is the size like uh, like back seat, I said, uh, or the Mini Cooper. Yeah. And this living room, like a back seat of um, Suburban or something like that, the SUV. Yeah. And you know, we see this in training and it's this big space and we practice, you know, going up there and what little compartments to open, how to start up the bathroom, things like that. And then when you arrive for launch, every square inch of that thing is packed and there's like no place. But fortunately, once you get to space, you're not going to sit on anything. You're just going to be floating around and in three dimensions, you actually have more, more room than you'd think. So this is a, st a static picture of th that, that Soyuz is inside uh, that rocket. Um, right on the top, this is tiny part of the rocket. This Actually, this is the Soyuz, and 95% of this huge thing, uh, it's just a rocket. Prop it's propulsion. Yeah. yeah, there are three stages, and uh, on the top, right on the top, there is a Soyuz and launch abort system on, on top. Okay. Hey, Steve, I'm just puzzled by the clock, because it says 14 minutes, but I yep, thought we had 45 doing. total? No. It changed? No. Really? Mm -mm. <laughs> this is a fast one. OK. This is super fast. Just Ariel said clicking. 45? You guys have until 5.45. Just, just OK. All right, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, what, what do you want us to do? Or? Keep going. OK, well, we're going. <laughs> OK, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Can't now take done. my minutes away from me, OK? <laughs> but this, I mean, we're watching, this is eight years ago for me inside here. But this just happened this afternoon to three real people on their way to space. And two of them for the very first time to actually get to orbit. This is my favorite scene. This is about a two minute movie here. It's my favorite scene of the movie because it's like what life is like up there, flying from place to place, uh, working ev up every day, upside down, right side up. There's our table at a diagonal, right? Oh, wow. Uh, and we're humans up there, and that's what we've been hearing a lot about today, is that all of us bring our own kind of way to bring others with us, and it's, it's also the way that we connect together. Uh, that's a famous picture, really, in a way, of the shuttle and the station docked together, taken as our crew left the station. And this gives you an idea of what it's like to look out that window. We don't see Aurora Australis like this every day. Probably I saw it about a dozen times. It depends on the sun cycle. Uh, but we do get to look out and see the Earth. This is a little faster than it really goes around. It's, it's sped up a little bit. It was a little disturbing to me to see it uh, at first. Uh, but, and it, but it's always nice to see home for my family. That's, uh, that's Ireland. And then gradually, for me, that shifts to just feeling like the whole planet is home. And it almost got to feel like a non sequitur to have some sort of a country patch on my shirt mm -hmm. or, or my jacket. Nice. And so that's the space station where they're arriving. And Nicole and I have lived. This was our crew of three people. Uh, this is what th will happen with uh, Christina and Nick and Alexei as their families will be in mission control, getting to say hello to them just moments after they arrive on the space station. That's uh, Dimitri's son on the right and his wife and my son and my, and my husband, Josh, who you heard from earlier today. And uh, this my last slide here just uh, shows you what... Uh, I think it's, it's interesting to join the worlds together. Josh made this kind of art showing different worlds and what it was like to explore them a dozen years before we ever met. Um, they did get cheaper for me after I got married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to bring a few things up uh, to space with us when we're station crew members, a few more than usual. And, and I actually couldn't take these pictures until really the day before I left because yeah. we had a shuttle crew up there. It really takes somebody to help take the pictures. 
and somebody to spot and me to do the thing. And we really, we were so busy, we just didn't have the time as a crew of, of, uh, of uh, six to, uh, to be taking those kinds of things. And I'll just uh, hand this over <laughs> in celebration yeah. of art. Yeah. I will sell, I hand this over to Nicole. Uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit about, I think, you know, like most things in life, it comes down to, um, you know, the people you get to share it with. And of course, on the couch today with um, two of them that I got to spend some time and space with. And, you know, going back also to that class of 2000, the, the young man on the end who's um, still looking for his grandeur, I think, is uh, uh, we were part of the same class, the Bugs, um, in 2000. So it's kind of cool to have the show and to meet somebody new who's about to go and experience it. I think it really is all about the people. Um, on my first flight, uh, that ride home on Atlantis was with uh, Leland and then Butch is on the right side there. Jeff Williams I spent time on the space station with. Um, but just some of the peeps and then of course that kind of that just beautiful picture of the masterpiece of station up there and the ride home on the bottom left and Katie and I you know we didn't fly on the same vehicle to the space station together but it was really cool to get there and have her you know floating and uh, waiting for me as I came through the hatch we worked together in that module the cupola which is this beautiful observatory that you know faces towards earth um, from space it is where astronauts are if you're not working, doing other things, and we actually got to hang out in there a little bit, but we also did some robotic work while we were there flying the arm to do who knows what. So Nicole is too modest to um, say that she's the first person to capture a supply ship from the space station. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an amazingly huge deal because the space station's like a factory, the supply ship's like a truck that pulls up, and if things go wrong, you can't move the factory. And there was a lot of things to work out between a lot of countries, it was Japanese supply ship, communication system, you know, countries around the world, mission controls around the world, and she was uh, the queen. And I was her backup, so I was the second yeah. person to do that. And actually, a moment that I'll just share with you was <laughs> walking into Japanese mission control. This was before it happened. <laughs> And Nicole was introduced as the first person that would capture their very first supply ship. And all of Mission Control just bowed. They bowed. <laughs> I mean, it it was the weirdest thing. It and I'll tell chills you, just to I, think about I still it. think about that because then it's like, okay, like there was no pressure before. Right. Now, <laughs> you know, it's like they're all <laughs> counting on you. Yep, and Katie did that the second time. And uh, I think you said earlier that Sunny was supposed to be the third one to do that. And we, we began um, to suspect that maybe only girls could do those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. <laughs> All right, so I, uh, I didn't mention before, but I retired from NASA about, oh, I guess like three and a half years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. But in that, in that retirement, of course, as I, it was a difficult decision to make to, you know, to know I wouldn't fly in space again. But, you know, aside from the space stuff, there, we do some really interesting things just as part of the astronaut office, not to mention getting to dive in the Nutribuoyancy Lab and fly in T-38 jets and, you know, help get new missions ready, all of those things that when you retire, you don't do those things anymore. That's but sad. Yeah. Um, but uh, once I got my warm fuzzy with that, I, I started thinking about, okay, so how should I because I felt obligated to. How should I share this really special experience that I had? And um, when I was in space, I had the chance to paint. I painted a watercolor painting, which, you know, we could talk about that. Um, it is different to paint with watercolors in space, but, and I will point out again for anyone in the future, Tony, if you go private, um, uh, Nikolai, when you're up there, oh, I'm pointing the wrong damn thing. Um, this up here. So that's my watercolor kit, which is still hopefully somewhere on the space station. So anybody that happens to find themselves up there, please go it. in search of it. It's, it's your mission. Uh, it would be nice to have it back. But I, I was able to paint in, in space. And it really, when I was thinking about retirement, how am I going to, you know, what am I going to do that's kind of different? I just kept coming back to this really special experience of getting to paint in space. And I thought, you know, art is like this universal communicator. You know, within science, we've been using art forever to communicate really complex things, not just to the general public, but among scientists themselves, too. And I thought, I can use art to reach audiences, unlike this one, that don't even know we have a space station, and get them knowing that this wonderful place exists and all of these things that we're doing in space that are really all about improving life on Earth. And I can also encourage them to become, you know, 
consider themselves earthlings, to understand we live on a planet, to recognize you know, the only border that's important is this thin blue line of atmosphere, and you know, all of those kinds of things that I think really are kind of the core of what I came back to Earth with. You know, we do some really complex things in space, but, and we all know we live on a planet, but I came back to Earth with this just undeniable truth of, wow, we are already all in space together and we need to start acting more like that. So anyway, and that the space station is this wonderful place to, um, as a model of how we should be living and working here on Spaceship Earth. Um, that art and space has come together for me, and I think in even a more meaningful way since being back, is that I can tie them together through some of these programs we've done with kids around the world, really space-themed art therapy kinds of programs, and working, working with kids in about 30 countries now. Um, we had the chance to paint with some kids in all of the International Space Station countries and use their art. Our, our spacesuit company, ILC Dover, built them into these spacesuits. Um, the suit on the left called Unity actually flew on the space station. And the first suit we were able to have fly because we didn't think they'd let us fly one of those big ones, you know, in the discretionary cargo. So we had the kids paint on this flight suit and Kate Rubens wore it for us while she was on the station. We did a video conference with the kids down on Earth. But I will just tell you, I have found through these programs more space inspires. I, I think there's nothing like it, actually. You can go anywhere on this planet and kids are psyched about space. Adults are psyched about space. And we can get kids thinking beyond their, you know, their current circumstances. We can get them thinking about their futures in a really beautiful way just by um, inspiring them with something that has to do with space. Oh, this is me too, isn't it? Okay. But okay. you know I'll, what? You I'll go. I'll just say that I um, <laughs> wanted to get the, the MIT part in there. We had you know, Aero Astro's celebration of the 50th anniversary. Um, this is actually the, like the day I was leaving the space station. Uh, Mike and Greg Shamatov came up uh, to install the AMS spectrometer. So I think a lot of us saw Sam Ting's talk this morning. We were the crew that was on the space station. <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What'd you do? No, you're good. I, I do. I do quota. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do quota for guys from this lab who uh -huh. designed these uh, robots. Uh, and, uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we went to see the lab. Anyways, uh, so th this is an experiment that came from MIT, and it's but serves both you know exploration rendezvous, and and then it also goes on to be education for thousands and thousands yeah. of kids around the world learning to do teamwork just like we're doing on the International Space Station. And Nikola? Yeah. Um, just a few words. Um, so 95% of our life, uh, it's not a space flight, it's not a uh, flying jets or something like that. So 95% we, we study. We just drill our skills and uh, space flights. Uh, uh, pretty risky business and we have to be pretty, really good in these things. So that's why we spend all our time drilling, drilling and drilling. And sometimes we have surviving trainings like uh, in the winter forest. Um, sometimes we uh, fly jets, or sometimes we fly uh, weightlessless. Uh, our colleagues in astronaut corps call it uh, Womit Comet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty funny. And we, we, we do <laughs> scuba diving, uh, we do a lot of training. And so it takes time to be ready for the space flights. Uh, it takes years of our lives. And uh, you cannot be, you cannot fly to space, you cannot be an astronaut or cosmonaut without years of preparation and without 100% uh, uh, ready for the space flight. So that's what we do. Almost always. And sometimes we'll fly to space, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Anthony. So, Tony's Dominic. never seen these slides, but it's uh, you know, we haven't had really much it. talk about you know, basically piloting. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, and maybe we'll have time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, so uh, two things. Um, I, I also left NASA about three and a half years ago. Um, I, Try to follow Nicole wherever she goes. Um, <laughs> the uh, two thoughts about the future. Um, personally, I want to see uh, humans walk on Mars. Um, and uh, um, I left NASA, but I haven't left the space community. So I'm uh, 
uh, working now on the Orion spacecraft, so we'll get humans back to the moon here real soon and then uh, figure out how to get them onto Mars. I personally believe that with today's technology we could do it if we had the right expedition mindset, right? And I think the MIT community uh, with the ideas of uh, uh, hands and minds, right? Let's just roll up our sleeves and build something and go do it. Um, it wouldn't be a first class journey um, like it might someday be in the future, but this is the community that uh, works on hard problems and just makes stuff happen. So uh, really excited about that. And then the other piece about the future uh, ties into what um, Nicole was saying, which is I believe that uh, everybody knows that they live on a planet. Um, I'll, show of hands, anybody doesn't want to fly in space? Brave enough to raise your hand, a couple. So Nicole said it, right? Um, you're flying in space right now. Um, and uh, you're on spaceship <laughs> Earth, and uh, I think we've got a terrific spaceship. Um, the, I spent a career in the Navy. One of the things they tell you it, first and most importantly is take care of your ship. Uh, right. I, I won't profess to know all the answers, um, but I, I will commit myself to helping uh, take care of the ship. Um, we've sent, I, 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 so everybody knows that. The folks that have flown just a couple hundred miles up and looked down on the planet, we feel it. And I thought, oh, well, so I'm not an, an artist of, I think, any flavor. Uh, but somehow, if we flew the right artist, they could come back and communicate that feeling uh, to the rest of the world. So the whole world should feel this. And uh, Nicole's a fantastic painter. Uh, Chris Hatfield and Ronnie Guerin play the guitar and sing. I got to believe somebody, oh, and Katie plays the flute. I got to believe somebody has written poetry, though. Mm -hmm. There's been dancing. Al Warden, Al Warden, amazing poet. Amazing poet. Yeah. Guess what? We've let you down, right? And we've had <laughs> nearly 600. <laughs> no offense. Well, I'm going to have to talk to you afterwards, actually. No, and we were we, trying. We've had nearly 600 chances uh, to find one of us uh, that was artistic enough to convey this feeling of we all live on Spaceship Earth together. So uh, I say you should give up on us. Stop waiting for us to find an artist that can convey this feeling to you. My solution now is we're just going to have to fly, y'all. You're just going to have to go up and experience <laughs> it. <laughs> you're, you're just going to have to experience it for yourself. Because, um, uh, but So the one ask, until we get that done, is, is take a look at the best of our artistic community, and, and Nicole's in there, she's trying to convey a feeling to you. And, uh, and I think it's a really important feeling for all of us to understand uh, for going forward to the future. Great. Yeah, another slide. Oh. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, right, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> there might even be another one. He Is there another one? He was telling me that I've he was telling me I don't do a good job conveying my feelings. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, as, as Tony said, and as what Nicole's been trying to communicate to the public, um, my job was to install the Columbus Laboratory to the to the International Space Station, and I thought that that would be the, my aha moment, that thing that you know, primary mission objective, all of those things. And when I was in Houston, I got the assignment. I kind of had a similar situation like you. The, all the German flight controllers, a lot of them were in Houston, and they said, you know, you're going to install our baby. We've been waiting 10 years. And I'm walking out of the room, and one guy blocks me, and he says, Mr. Melvin, we've been waiting 10 years. Don't screw it up. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, no pressure. You know, I'm installing this thing, and it's like, don't screw it up, you know. But we get it installed, and. And we float over to the Russian segment, and we have this incredible meal with African-American, Asian-American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander of the space station, going around the planet every 90 minutes, 17,500 miles per hour, breaking bread with people we used to fight against. And this was that moment when I had that orbital shift, that perspective change, that changed me forever. And I think if, if we can convey this with people, through our storytelling, through VR, through other ways, because there are only going to be so many people to get a chance to fly in space. I mean, everyone in this room is going, but you know, the other people yeah. <laughs> will have to get something for them. And uh, you know, this one picture kind of says it all about us being one 
civilization, one humanity working together. And if Yuri flips the wrong switch, if Dan flips the wrong switch, if I flip the wrong switch, we're all gone. And this is playing with your food in space. I'm going to skip over this. We only have yep. nine more minutes left. Yep. I agree. Um, but oh, that's the. That's the yeah. That's that one. Uh huh. That's Little Melvin. But Little Melvin. <laughs> And, you know, really, for us as a community, you know, we have to make sure that that next generation of explorers has what they need to take our places. And how to I was at a conference in D.C., how to prepare students for jobs we can't yet imagine, how to ensure all students can meet the level of rigor, and how to build learning experiences that spark passion. And that's part of that perspective shift that we get bringing it back down to our home planet. So that's extremely important. And when we think about equality and justice, the kids on the left have the same thing. One can't see the game. Justice is when you get what you need to be successful, to ensure that all of you in this room, the kids, the people you reach out to, have what they need to, to see the game. Talk about the Lego, the Lego sets and Catherine and Margaret. And yeah, so many of you know, have seen the movie laughing. Hidden Figures. This is Catherine Johnson. We work together at NASA Langley Research Center. And she inspired me in so many ways. And I remember when I gave her a, a copy of my book, she, the first thing she asked me at 100 years old, she said, Leland, when are we going to Mars? You know, forget <laughs> this book thing, you know. <laughs> when are we getting to Mars? And she wanted to know more about the future. And this is the woman that designed the trajectories for Apollo, for Gemini, John Glenn. Mercury, and the shuttle. Yeah, and, and was one of the most humble, you know, selfless people that did not want the fame or the fortune. And she was just... You know, in Hidden Figures, she just rocks yeah, She's the, house. the star of the movie Hidden Figures. Yeah, so anyway. Um, this, this picture is the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight, which was 50 years after Yuri Gagarin launched mm. from Baikonur, uh, from a, a launch pad there, the very same launch pad that I launched from and uh, that Nikolai yep. will likely launch from. And uh, the shirts that we're wearing celebrating Yuri's night, as it's we're called. Sure. Um, this, this is, it really meant a lot to us to, and we're holding a picture of Yuri Gagarin. So our crew was on board the station on April 12th, 2011, 50 mm -hmm. years later. And so it's really wonderful to be here celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Mm -hmm. And I think that individual people make these kinds of differences. Um, there's a lot that that shirt says. It's a picture of Yuri Gagarin. The fact that it's on the space station, uh, that, you know, with one up there for all of us, is actually thanks to Loretta Whitesides, yeah, who is she? here uh, talking about talking for Virgin Galactic earlier. And you know, I I think we we uh, she's 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 part of the force behind, uh, and in fact, I would say the giant mover and shaker behind the fact that Yuri's night, a night April twelfth, that around the planet, in hundreds of cities around the planet, we celebrate the fact that Yuri Gagarin launched into space. And one person and her friends started that, and she's here with us. Right. And so each of us has that kind of power inside of us. And I think that's what Ariel's intent is in, in having, or the Media Lab's intent in, in having us all get together is for us to discover what other people are doing, but realize that each of us has you know, some missions inside of us, and we should believe in those and, and carry them out. And so with that, uh, this is the, the last picture, and we'll just take questions. This is our friend, uh, all of our friend, uh, Tracy Caldwell. It's a self-portrait. To me, it's the epitome of a, a woman uh, who's uh, a, a, a person and their, their relationship with our planet. And she may look like she's in space, but really, I mean, space is a place that belongs to all of us. We just hadn't been there yet. Right. And, and so it's there for all of us. So with that, I would love to take questions. So thank you. That was a, a wonderful panel. Um, thinking about Mars, you were up there, and, and Nicole, you, they, you said that they had to grab your fingers away from leaving space. But a 1,000 days, that changes the paradigm completely. So if you can just talk a little bit about how you would prepare for a mission like that. You know, I think the preparation will be a lot like we already do, you know, because um, most of it comes down, I think, to the teaming aspect of how you work together in, you know, interesting environments and challenging situations and that kind of thing. I think the biggest difference is going to be that there is going to be a point as you're traveling in however many months that is getting off this planet and to Mars where Earth is not out the window anymore. And I think that's going to be... Um, 
I, I, I don't know, maybe not psychologic. I don't, I don't think we can't overcome it, but I think it's going to be a very big difference to how we've lived and worked in, in space so far because this, there is a connection that you maintain. I mean, you're, even if you're only 240 miles off the planet, that's the farthest I've ever been <laughs> and ever will likely be off the planet. And honestly, you feel, because you have that below you, you feel more connected to it, I think, than you sometimes do right down in the middle of it. And I think it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a, it's a stability thing. It's a, when, when we it's were, like a... When we were in Antarctica, um, I, I got to spend some training time there. And, and you could find the next person with a question while, we're, while I'm finishing a real quick answer here, is that um, we were so far, we were 200 miles from the South Pole, and there was literally nothing on the horizon. I mean, you just looked, and there weren't mountains. There, it just was flat. There just wasn't a horizon. And then we got to a point where we were, where we actually saw some mountains in the, in the distance, and it was kind of like, Camelot to me, like, oh, there's a place, there's something there. And it was interesting to me that it made me feel so much better. And, you know, maybe we should turn to these, uh, to people who can't physically see for this kind of like, how do they sustain themselves with this power of perspective? So we'll, we'll have to search further for those answers. Um, someone else with a question? And I would just add holodeck. Ah, yes, I would, I would add that too. <laughs> uh, question back there, whoever's got, go ahead. Thank you for the wonderful talk. So my question is, for the astronauts, what's the strangest thing about the cosmonauts? And for you, Nicola, what's the strangest yep. thing about the astronauts? <laughs> oh. Um, the way we look, right? <laughs> so, um, the main difference just in, in name, because uh, we've been flying together for many years, for decades, and uh, it's, we do the same job all together on the station during our preparation. And uh, we are just one family with different people from different countries, from the United States, from Russia, from Europe. And uh, we, are all, we are the same. Uh, I think one of the uh, key points in, in this, uh, you cannot see borders on Earth from space. And it, it, this, this, this fact changes everything in your mind when you think about it, so we are all passengers of the, on the one uh, huge spacecraft and it's only one we have. And so we, we do it because we are dreamers, we are professionals, and we are family. So we are different, but we are all together and we do the same job. Tony? And um, it was interesting for me, uh, I did some uh, cold weather training with a, a small group and uh, uh, Dima was one of them. And I never flew in space with Dima, but one of, one of y'all did because I, I saw his picture yep. uh, earlier. And uh, we came back and we were uh, being uh, quizzed about our training by the psychologist. And uh, Dima was a, a Russian MiG-29 pilot and I was a US Navy uh, F-18 pilot, right? So they were... Uh, the psychologist was asking, hey, how was your relationship with Dima? And it turns out, I never really studied cultural hierarchy, uh, but it was uh, different than uh, at least what the psychologist assumed. And, uh, and probably if I would have assumed something, it would have been different than I would have guessed. But Dima and I see the world exactly the same, right? It's <laughs> the fighter pilot culture ended up transcending. Right. Um, and our, then the biggest differences was how fighter pilots and scientists see the world, right? In this <laughs> training exercise we had to go do. And so I was like, yeah, uh, don't assume uh, that whatever cultural hierarchy might, uh, you might imagine is in place, that different cultures will, uh, will transcend that in uh, some big and, and some, I say, small, but powerful. Awesome. Any last comments? We have a minute left. Or do you want to take a question? To the question. Question, one more question. I have a question. Thank you for your insights uh, from and recognizing that we're all on Spaceship Earth. And my question is, uh, how long can we keep the space station flying and what can we all do to make that happen? <laughs> I tend to, you know, like any field, when you read the news, if it's a field you really know, you kind of go, it's not exactly like that. And I feel that way when people use the, the words 2024 for the end of the space station, in that you know, that thing can run for a really long time and it's an important experiment place to try out things for going further, whether that's the moon or Mars. And I just believe in, in using everything that's useful 
And at the same time, there'll come a natural point where the space station is sort of sucking resources in people who are comfortable working on that mission, and it keeps NASA and other and everyone else who's who's making the paving the way to space, which is many of us now. Um, it keeps them from really being able to focus on bigger things and take bigger steps. So I, I don't get attached to numbers. I get attached to capabilities. Does anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, that's great. Good answer. Yeah. Ariel, are we done? Take one more. One more question. Yay. <laughs> uh, right, in the, right in the middle. In you middle. can just yell. Or the, you can yeah. throw that thing. We've we have been really shy with early the microphone. Work, you can, like, you know, toss that thing. Um, in space, where do you go for like a little alone time just to be on yourself? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the this, this space station is pretty ginormous. I mean, <clears throat> Katie described it, you know, 10 of these like school bus size modules. And even during the day with six crew members, you could go your separate ways and not see each other all day if you didn't want to. Uh, we each have our own private crew compartment, you know, size of a uh, phone booth kind of thing. So you could go in there if you wanted to. but. Um, I don't know, I never really felt like I had to do that. I felt like you could get around enough throughout the day that you didn't feel like at some point, it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta get away from these people. They were, I never felt that. I mean, I think more I felt like, wow, why aren't they at the window looking out at this same thing that I am right now, you know? And it, just experiencing it to all together. To together. Yeah, yep. yeah. And, you know, we had opportunity to speak to our families, um, and you could do that, you know, at one end of the station on a computer and be completely comfortable that you were having a private conversation, at least, you know, within the space station. How they were monitoring on the ground, I can't guarantee. But, um, you know, but there were, you know, you, you had, it, it was just such a beautiful space to be in. And um, I don't know, I always used to joke because people would ask, we used to get this, what was it, like $2 a day or something uh, with some per diem. like yeah. per diem thing. And I'm like, like incidentals or something. There was no hazard pay you or anything like that, pay. but you got like this little thing. You got like 50 bucks when you got back or something. And I was like, what is that? Like, you know, the money I'm going to go spend that in the European module, like vacation <laughs> in Europe or Japan or something. I think that was bots. Yeah, <laughs> but, I think yeah. a certain amount of, I mean, and you always had as much privacy as you ever wanted. I mean, there really was, you had your cabin, you had, there's lots of places. Um, I, I think but uh, the ability to be a little bit alone in a sort of being able to have a conversation. We have an IP phone. We can call the ground. It's as private as any cell phone conversation is, which are not, right? <laughs> but I mean, basically, I, I figure if anybody really needs to yeah. listen to me, you know, chatting with my, my husband, my family, we got to, I think we talked every day, but three. But the ability to have a conversation not within earshot of each other, um, was important to me. I think there's just different ways you can isolate yourself. Even on the shuttle, you know, you need your time, um, your sort of space, and we used to create that maybe with a headset and listening to your own music, it puts you in your own kind of world. So there's different ways of achieving that, and you get a lot of practice during training. We had something called the glass bottom boat time where you go back on the shuttle and you would sit on top of the overhead windows, and as you look down at the planet, it was like you're on a glass bottom boat looking down at the Everglades or something, like, oh, I'm on a glass bottom boat. Because so you can sit on your ceiling. You can sit anywhere. Yeah. Very convenient. Very neat. <laughs> Mine was, uh, so I only flew uh, on the space shuttle. We went to the space station both times, and so there, you don't have really any uh, alone space on the space shuttle. It, it's uh, too small, though. A couple of times I was the only person on the space shuttle while the rest of the crew was on the space station. So that was kind of cool. I felt like I had my own spaceship. Um, <laughs> they trusted you too. But, uh, <coughs> uh, he had the keys. On, uh, mm -hmm. on, my, on my first mission, I had one of those afternoons where you needed just a little bit of alone time, right? I was just going really hard and working hard and thinking and just starting to get that, that bad headache coming on feeling and went, okay, I got to get somewhere quiet and close my eyes for just a couple of minutes and I can reset and I'll be fine. I didn't think to tell everybody that that was <laughs> the case. I just went off and found it. It turns out on the shuttle missions, you pack, pack the shuttle full and you're going to do a lot of cargo transfer, uh, take as much stuff up to the space station crews as you possibly can. So we got these really large uh, storage bags, and I think we had them uh, on, the, on the deck two high and on the ceiling three high. So there's Huge, the whole giant. Yeah, big giant uh, rectangle bags, boxes. Um, and so when we got docked, we moved them all to the uh, Columbus module, luckily, since uh, Leland got it installed. Um, 
Thank you. And uh, so they, we had just bungeed them uh, to the deck there, and uh, we were working through the transfer process, right, taking stuff out, making sure it got exactly uh, put in place, uh, and then and bringing trash or, or other important equipment back and packing it up. And so they, were, they just lived there for a few days. Uh, so just happened to be going by there. They were big rectangle boxes or bags, and they were all bungeed. So I had my hooded sweatshirt, which is mostly where I go to hide, and uh, slid under the bungee cord in between these big bags and closed my eyes. And I don't think I was there very long. And John Phillips, one of my shuttle crewmates, was responsible for all this cargo transfer. So he was going back and forth to these big bags and had the checklist <laughs> and uh, floats up upon me, uh, bungeed uh, with my eyes closed. And I don't know what he thought he found, but he screamed. <laughs> and I looked up at somebody screaming at me when I was just trying to close my eyes and get some quiet time. He scared me, so I screamed at him. <laughs> and then the rest of the crew heard two of us screaming and didn't know what was coming on. So. So you can find alone time, but I recommend you let people know what you're doing. <laughs> so with that. <laughs> so having heard that great story that none of us had ever heard uh, before, before. Um, I want to thank everybody for being great thank panelists. You, and uh, it was really wonderful to be here, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody in space together. Thank All you. Right. Thank Tony you. promised. <laughs>